Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you wave at me if you can hear me? Yes. It's great to be with you all. As uh, Martin said at the beginning, my name's Tom, and I'm one of the elders or pastors at Hope Church in Ipswich. Just come down the A12 today uh, to be with you all. It's great to be here. The last time I was here uh, was February last year, and I think things weren't still quite back to normal uh, following COVID. So it's great to be with you, and there's lots of you here, and there's children's work happening and uh, it's been a brilliant time already uh, together in the presence of God. So thank you for having me with you. Um, Friday night I just got back from Albania uh, where I'd spent the week um, at a conference for um, leaders across our wider family of churches. So uh, we're part of relational mission but we're part of a wider family of families called New Frontiers and um, I've been invited to serve at this conference and speak uh, in the week Um, but it was wonderful that it wasn't a bunch of people from the UK uh, coming and telling people from Europe what to do. Most of the contributors were from different nations. Uh, We heard from uh, people in uh, Ukraine, um, Armenia, uh, Poland, Germany, Bulgaria, um, Portugal, and also we heard from a pastor in Nazareth in Israel, uh, which was really cool. And he was sharing um, some great stories about what God is doing uh, in the Middle East amongst uh, Muslim majority nations where uh, people are coming to know Jesus in, in wonderful ways, <laughs> miraculous things happening. And uh, it was wonderful to hear from him. It was great also to be in Albania where Uh, 50 or 60 years ago, it was declared as the world's first atheist state, and there was a massive clampdown on any kind of religion, and now to see a number of churches growing up there now that are part of our family of churches, and others that are not, and uh, now tens of thousands of uh, believers uh, in Jesus, which is wonderful. Uh, God can't be stopped. We've we've sung that already today, that uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? And uh, he's up to great things. It was wonderful also to hear from uh, a guy who helps to look after the churches in Ukraine, a Ukrainian guy. And uh, he was being, uh, someone was interpreting for him who was from Russia. And that was a beautiful picture just of what God's kingdom is like. And, uh, and it was a beautiful moment really at the end as just as, as the, the two of them were able to really embrace and, and declare that we are part of the same family, even though our nations are at war. Um, but what was particularly encouraging was to hear uh, that what God is doing in Ukraine, most of the Ukrainians at the conference are still living in Ukraine. Um, Some of them have come over to England. Um, But they were speaking of unprecedented opportunities to share the gospel with people, where there was such a receptivity because people have lost everything. They've got nothing left of what they had. And people coming to know Jesus and great works going on amongst refugees, particularly in the west of Ukraine, uh, where people have fled to. So God is up to good things. I want to encourage you with that. Please be praying for uh, those nations that I've listed and praying for uh, the situation in Ukraine. Let's keep praying for that. Um, But this morning, I just, I felt like uh, God gave me a message uh, this week, actually, uh, that I felt to share with you guys um, from Psalm 145. So if you have a Bible, you might like to turn there now. But this is really not a message I've preached elsewhere. It's not a uh, a recycled one. I feel it's like one that God's given me this week. And I think it's going to be helpful for you guys. I hope it will. I've called this praising God to the next generation. Praising God to the next generation. So Psalm 145 is where we're going to be. Um, Psalms are in the middle of the Bible. They're a collection of songs and poems uh, written by people like King David and others. We're going to read the first 13 verses and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation today. So this is what uh, David says. I will exalt you, my God and King, And praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all his creation. 
All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule throughout all generations. We'll leave it there. You might want to read the rest of the psalm later on. It's a glorious psalm. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this church, what you're doing through this church. We, we just want to invite you today to work in our hearts. We pray that this will not be just something that we talk about over lunch and then forget about, but that actually you would do something deep in our hearts today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, life is lived at quite a pace, isn't it? Martin touched upon that at the beginning. Sometimes we're racing at 100 miles an hour between all of the different things that we have to do, different responsibilities that we have, that we don't really often stop to think and ask, what am I doing here? Why has God kept me alive? We believe God is sovereign even over life and death. He gives and takes away. We've sung that this morning. So that means that he's kept us alive for a reason. I believe you're going to go into a series soon in Philippians. Is that right? And the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, in the letter to the Philippians, he speaks about to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he starts asking this question, what's better? And he starts saying, well, actually, to remain in the body, to live means fruitful labor. So he's come to his understanding that if I'm being kept alive by God, it means he's got fruitful labor for me. He's got work for me to do in his kingdom. That's why he's kept me alive. And so if we were to take a moment in the quietness of the day today and say, God, why have you kept me alive? I believe his answer is because I've got fruitful labor for you. I believe a big part of the answer is found in this psalm when it comes to proclaiming him to the next generation. That's why I believe he's kept you alive. That's why I believe he's sustaining you because he's got things for you to bring to the next generation, for you to proclaim to the generation that's come after you. And that goes for those of you who are younger in the room here as well as those who are older. I believe that God has got us alive and a big part of it is because he wants us to praise him to the next generation. There was a great writer uh, from the last century called C.S. Lewis. Many of you will have heard of him. And he said the following. We delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. I'll share that again. We delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. Do you get that? So if you've gone out for a really nice meal somewhere, we went to such and such a place and it was incredible. The meal was amazing. The service was wonderful. You, you have to tell others because you haven't told you that the enjoyment of it has not been complete until you've told others about it. Or if you said, hey, did you see the goal that Ipswich scored yesterday? You have to see the goal. It's amazing. Look, I would use a Norwich example, but they didn't score yesterday. So I, haven't, I can't use that one. But you would want to say to people, hey, did you see the goal? It was incredible. You have to see it. Go on YouTube. Watch the highlights. Because it was such an enjoyable moment that the, the, your enjoyment of it is not complete until someone else has heard about it. Or a great movie that you've watched. Hey, you've got to go and check out this movie. It's amazing. We've not fully enjoyed it until we've, we've praised it to others. So David in this psalm is, is showing us that praise is not just music and song, although that's a big part of it, but actually proclaiming it to others. Part of our praise, part of our worship of God is that we might proclaim him to others. And not just his goodness, but actually we saw in this psalm, there's so many attributes that David wants to get across. His goodness his splendor, his glory, his wonderful miracles, his greatness, his, the story of his wonderful goodness, that he's merciful and compassionate. These are the things that we get to proclaim about him, that we get to praise uh, 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 him to others in. And today I particularly want to just uh, speak to us about praising him to the next generation. Now, I'm, I'm not an expert in youth culture, okay? 
I, for about 10 years of my life, gave myself to uh, youth work in the churches that I've been part of. Uh, as a volunteer, that was kind of not my job, but gave myself to it. Many uh, evenings, many hours poured into uh, commending Jesus to the next generation. But I'm no expert, but I, I know a bit. And even now, still to, today, today, have some involvement in the youth work uh, in our church. And it, we don't have to look far or know much to know that this is a generation, if I'm particularly thinking about uh, those who are under 25, who are uh, facing an awful lot of difficulties. It, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's, it's a very broken situation. Now listen, I want us to understand there's not, there's not been a golden generation that we can sort of try and reach back to where it was all perfect. But there are huge, huge issues facing the next generation in our nation. Some of the stuff that's not new, that's been going on for decades, like knife crime and yeah, violence, essentially, substance use. But there's also things that are new. As social media has uh, risen up and up, there's increase in self-harm, increase in gender dysphoria, increase in uh, young women particularly having body image issues because of the things that they've seen on social media that are just unrealistic, unattainable. The rise of pornography use amongst young people. BBC re reported very recently that a quarter of all 16 to 20 year olds had seen explicit pornography by the time that they were 10. It's a mess. It's a mess. There's a whole load of huge difficulties facing our nation. The rise of anxiety and depression, huge mental health problems, looking ahead to the future and very deeply concerned about what is life going to bring, and the rise in, of broken families where there's not a safety net of support that maybe there once was where teenagers would, have, teenagers would have once had. There's an awful lot. There's an awful lot of stuff going on. I don't think I've really scratched the surface with that short description, but we don't have to look far to understand that it is a mess. There's some real huge, huge problems. Then there's the cost of living crisis and people wondering, are, we, are my family even going to be able to stay in our home? If we, if we stop to think for a minute, it is hugely broken. There's, there's, it, it seems like an impossibly broken situation, like there's no way out of it. It's heartbreaking. And Jesus wept when he saw Jerusalem on the, the, the week where he was betrayed and crucified. Just a few days before his crucifixion, he saw the city of Jerusalem and he wept over it. He wept. He was, uh, we read, he had compassion and the word for compassion in the original language that the New Testament was mostly written in, in Greek, is like deeply pained in the stomach, deeply within, just deeply troubled. He saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And sheep without a shepherd don't really know what they're doing. I spend time with a lady in our church sometimes who's a shepherd and uh, I've seen her training younger shepherds and she's an incredible lady. And uh, we see, just, I mean, sheep are really stupid. They really are. They get into all kinds of problems. They need guiding. They need shepherding. And Jesus saw the crowds in Jerusalem and he had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd, facing all kinds of difficulties, without hope, without guidance. We sang this morning, we found a hope stronger and nothing compares. Well, Listen, we have a generation in our nation that does not have a hope, that is facing all these difficulties and facing not only separation from God now and in eternity, but actually hopelessness. No way out. This will be true in Lowestoft. It will be as true in Lowestoft as it is in Ipswich. It's, broken, it's brokenness. Surely this is a generation that needs more than ever the generations ahead of it to proclaim his goodness to them, to praise him to them, to speak of him to them. Surely, and I believe, Lowestoft Community Church, that even today as we drive back from 
this place to our homes. I believe that God's going to cause our eyes to be open in new ways. I believe he's going to cause compassion to stir up in new ways as we go from this place, that he's going to help us to see some things. But I want to share just very quickly now five convictions I believe we need to have. So if you like to take notes, you can, you can write these five things down as we go. Five things that, five things that I believe we need to uh, hold on to and not let go of and be shaped by. Things that we need to be convinced of if we're going to praise God to the next generation. If we're going to be that generation that commends him to the next. The first is, as I've already shared really, we need to be convicted of the desperation of the situation. It will get a bit more cheerful, guys, okay? But we, we need to be convicted of the desperation of the situation. The reality is in this nation that 5% of people go to church on a regular basis. Now, you might say, well, there'll be some people who can't go to church through illness or other reasons, so there might be more than that. There may be, that may be true, but there will also be people in churches who are exploring what it's all about or going along because, hey, it's tradition. I'm pleasing other people by doing it. So maybe 5% is about realistic. So 5% of people who might, this is our best guess, 5% of people who might be in a living, active relationship with God through his son Jesus. That is desperate. And of that 5%, it will be heavily weighted to the over 50s. And if you're over 50, this is not a comment about, you, you are so valued. God loves you. He really does. But the situation is pretty desperate, right? For the under 50s. If of that 5%, most of them are not in the under 20s age group. That's pretty desperate. And it means that in 25, 30 years time, hundreds of churches, thousands of churches, if things stay as they are, will shut down. There'll be no one left. So it's a desperate situation. We mustn't kind of, kind of gloss over that. There is, God is doing many, many encouraging things in this nation. I don't despair, but I do believe we need to have our eyes opened and we must not be... Uh, ignorant of what's going on. Nehemiah, right at the beginning of the book of Nehemiah, he learns of the situation in Jerusalem. He's in another nation. He and many of his Jewish brothers and sisters have been exiled to another nation. And what happens at, right at the beginning of Nehemiah is one of his brothers comes to him. You can read about it if you want to, if you want to turn there. Hanai, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. You could think Israel there. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And this is Nehemiah's response when he hears this report. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned. I fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. And then we read his amazing prayer to God. So he, he understood the reality of the situation and it caused him to mourn for days and days and weep. And I believe that God might be just even now, as I'm sharing, might be putting this in your heart. And there may be some that are just being moved as you kind of face up to the reality of the situation in our nation. And there may be a weeping that might come in the days and weeks that follow. A mourning for the situation. It's a desperate situation. I'm an optimist by nature, but this is not good. It's not good. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a good situation. So the first is that we might be convicted of the, desperate, the desperateness of the situation. Secondly, that we might be convicted of our need to pray. Nehemiah, when he hears the report, he mourns and he fasts and then he prays. Might we be like Nehemiah, who don't stay in that place of, gosh, this is desperate, but that we be a praying people. That we might we might pray 
and pray and pray for the next generation until we start to see this turning around, until we start to see things changing. Listen, the, gen the generation to come, their salvation will not come about unless we pray. It can't be that we only pray, and we'll come on to that in a little while, but we must pray. Prayer is essential in this. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, without me, you can do nothing. He's not saying you can't like, go and brush your teeth without me. <laughs> He's speaking of you, you can't do things of eternal significance without me. You can't see people's hearts change without me. And he shows, his, he shows his disciples this right at their calling and right again before he goes to ascend to heaven. When he first calls Peter, Peter's been fishing all night, an experienced fisherman fishing all night. And Jesus says to him from the shore, why don't you cast your net out into the deeper waters? And Peter does so. And brings in a catch that is so big he needs his friends to help him. And then when Peter has betrayed or rather denied Jesus and Jesus comes to restore him, what happens again? He and his mates are fishing all night long. You can read about it in John chapter 21, this wonderful post-Easter story. And they've been fishing all night and they've caught nothing. And Jesus says, have you tried the other side of the boat? <laughs> Which is kind of a crazy thing for a non-fisherman to say to some experienced fishermen, isn't it? And what happens? They bring in an enormous catch. The, the nets are bursting. Jesus is showing them through this. Without me, you can do nothing. You've got to rely on me. You have to pray. You have to come to me. Because Jesus knew where that shoal of fish was at that very moment. Listen, he knows what's going on in our nation. I said I'm no youth culture expert. I really am not. He is. He knows what's going on in the hearts of young people. He knows what the challenges are that they're facing. He knows better than anyone. He's got the insights we need. He knows where the shoulder fish is. He knows what's going on. We must come to him and say, Lord, help us. So we don't know what we're doing. We need your help. We must call upon him and say, Lord, we need you. Corporate prayer is going to be essential in this, I believe. Not just for Lowestoft Community Church, but for a Hope Church in Ipswich and for hundreds, thousands of other churches. We must, I believe, give ourselves to praying for the next generation. We've got to go in a prayer adventure here because this is a crisis. We pray when there's a crisis, don't we? We see that in the Bible, in the book of Acts, where Peter and John are told by the religious leaders, stop preaching about Jesus. What do they do? They have a prayer meeting. They go and pray about it. They get the church together and they pray about it. A little while later, Peter uh, is in prison. His mate James has just been killed on account of his faith. Peter's next. And what do the church do? They get together and they pray. They call out to God. When there's a crisis, we pray. I've seen in our church in Ipswich, when we went through the building project that we've been through, God uh, gave us a cinema right in the center of the town. And it was, it was a bigger project, project that we could, than what we could handle in the natural. We, might, we needed to pray. We had to pray. There was, a, there was a crisis that focused our attention and got us praying in a big way. And I believe as we face up to the reality of this situation, that we will be churches who start to pray intentionally for the next generation. That we will say, Lord, we need you to come and move in Lowestoft. We need you to come and bring young people to salvation in lower stuff. We need you to come and help us, give us strategy, give us insight, give us courage. We've got to pray, friends. We've got to pray because it's a crisis. So maybe there's even some now, you just know, I've got to be one of those people. I've got to be someone who prays. I've got to be someone who gives myself to this. Thirdly, we've got to be convicted. We've got to be convinced of the power of the gospel. We've got to be convinced of this. We don't have a new message for the next generation. There's a whole load of new challenges that have arisen in the last 20 years, but we don't have a new message. We don't have a, a, a whole new solution. The solution is ancient. Yes, we might want to contextualize that. We might want to help people to understand it, but the message is not different. It's not one message for one generation, one for a next. No, no, we, we don't change the message. What we have, friends, is a foolish message. 
It's a, it's a foolish message to the natural man. A message of Jesus coming to earth and living a perfect life and then dying on a cross in apparent failure and defeat and then rising again. It's, it, it's not palatable for kind of the logical mind. It's not something that is going to be in the natural something that people think, yeah, that's exactly what I need to hear. But it's what people need to hear. It, it doesn't change. The message doesn't change. It's a, it's a foolish, me- foolish message, but it doesn't change. We've got to proclaim Christ Jesus crucified for our sin and rising again. That's the answer to all of the things that I've talked about already this morning, ultimately, because what that means is that we can enter in through Jesus, enter into relationship with God, who gives us hope, who gives us security, who gives us foundations on which to build, who gives us family around us, who frees us from our shame, who brings us security so we're not thinking, I've got to be like that person, or I've got to chase after this uh, this thing that might somehow make me worth it. No, no, God, the, the, the solution is in the gospel, friends. Do we believe that? Do we believe that to be true? Or do we think, well, a different government might help? Or a different, uh, you know, me- some different medication or therapy might help? Or some other solution? Or, you know, an upturn in the economy? What, what do we think is the answer? It's the gospel. Those other things might be well and good. I don't know. But the, the gospel is the answer. Are we convinced of that? Are we convinced that it's Jesus and him crucified and risen again for us? That is the message that will save people and transform lives. Do we believe that in all our hearts? If we don't ask God to help us. Fourthly, let us be convicted that we each play a part in this. This is one generation to the next. It's not the pastor to the next generation and it's not the youth leader to the next generation i believe in youth leaders and youth workers i think that's so such a necessary thing i believe we should invest 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 in next generation ministry but this is one generation to the next this is one generation proclaiming god's goodness and mercy and power and mighty acts to the next this is what this psalm says. You're, you're never too old to speak of God's goodness to the next generation. One or two of you might think, I'm way past that. <laughs> I can't do that. Listen, do you know last week, David Attenborough was voted the nation's most beloved TV presenter. Okay, that's a, from a sample of people of all ages. So it's not Anton Deck, it's not whoever else. <laughs> He's 96. Why is he so loved? Well, it's because he's really passionate about what he does. He's got an amazing voice, iconic voice. But he's really passionate about what he does. He really believes in it. He really thinks we should go and try and save the penguins or whatever. He really, he really, he lo- he really is passionate about it. And so people listen to him. doesn't matter that he's 96. Listen, might we be those that... Don't just play church. But don't just kind of turn up with a nice smile on, say some religious language, and go home and don't live it out. I think the next generation, I think this has always been the case, but younger people are very perceptive. They, they know when it's just a game. They know when it's just a, I just kind of go through the motions kind of thing. Why would it be something they would want to enter into? Because we're talking about a generation coming up that's very authentic, wants to live authentic, done with, done with it all, want to live authentic lives, want to get hold of something that is real, not that's fake. Can we be those that are so enjoying God for ourselves, that are so trusting in him for ourselves, that we have stories to share with the next generation, that we have things to be able to say, I stepped out because God was leading me and he came through for me. Or I stood up and uh, stood up for this particular thing and God sustained me. Might we be those that actually have stories that we can pass to the next generation and not just kind of going through the motions. 
You're, not, you're never too old to pass on to the next generation. Young people want to see passion. Listen, I remember as a, as a, as a teenager um, being sometimes a bit embarrassed by my dad when he was worshipping. He became a Christian when I was four or five years old. We went to church ever since then. And in my teenage years, I kind of got a bit, occasionally got a bit embarrassed because he was going for it in worship. I tell you what, I'm so glad that he didn't hold back. Because I, I, I look back now and say, I saw something authentic in his life. And it wasn't just, you know, it was in the car as well, right? <laughs> and, he could, and, and he couldn't sing at all. <laughs> but it was like, this was a man who was passionate about Jesus. And I saw it. And I, and I see that it was real. This wasn't just a kind of, I turn up on a Sunday with my fake smile on. We need, to, we need to praise him to the next generation. And you are never too old for that. Listen, we need youth leaders. We need those that give themselves to this. But you, you, you have a part to, all of us have a part to play in this. Finally, let us be convicted. Let us have convictions, but let us have compassion. Listen, conviction and compassion we need in equal measure. We need to be convicted of some things. We, we need to be those that Stick to what we see as the plain reading of the Bible. Not kind of go with cultural trends that will keep changing. <laughs> they will keep changing. Listen, the sexual revolution is nowhere near finished. <laughs> we might think the sexual revolution happened back in the 60s and 70s. It is nowhere near finished. And to think otherwise is naive. It really is. There will, there will be more and more changes, more and more trends. Things will keep evolving and changing. We've got to stick to what is the plain reading of this book. We have to have conviction. But can we also be people of compassion? Listen, what we want to be, one of our core values in our family of churches is the grace of God. That we celebrate his grace. That we're founded on his grace. That we understand that he saved us. He made us alive in Christ when we were dead in our sins. He reached into the pit. He pulled us out. It wasn't us kind of like meeting him halfway. <laughs> it was all of his grace. If we believe that to be true, then we should be the most compassionate people on the planet. But if we kind of airbrush the gospel and think, well, he's kind of just made some vaguely naughty people a bit better, <laughs> then we're going to look upon other people and, and see the massive changes going on in society and we're going to kind of like judge people. We're going to look down our noses at people. But if we're a church that celebrates the grace of God and what it really means and what he really has done for us, then we'll look upon a lost and broken world and we'll have compassion. Because we were not just a bit dirty and needed cleaning up a little bit. No, no, we were dead in our sins. We were, complete, we were nowhere. We were just as lost and like sheep without a shepherd. So this is why, friends, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, what business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? He says, is it not those within the church that we're to judge? What does he mean by that? It means that actually within the church, we're to be sharpening one another and helping each other in love to walk in Jesus' ways. But he says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? That's God's job is what he says. You can read it for yourself. So we're not looking on, friends, at the, the huge problems that there are in our society and, the, and what will continue, I think, at a breakneck speed to continue to be uh, changes that will move further and further away from uh, God's best. We're not looking on and thinking, oh, goodness me. These people. We're actually looking on and we're having compassion. If we're celebrating the grace of God, if we understand where he's taken us from, we're looking on and we have compassion. Can we be those who have conviction and compassion? It's not our job to make people who don't behave like Christians behave like Christians. <laughs> we want to share the gospel of Jesus with people. We want them to come from death to life from bondage to freedom. We want them to know Jesus and then they go on a journey 
of being conformed to be more and more like him as their minds are renewed. So we're not trying to say to the world, hey, be more Christian, even though you don't believe. (laughs) We're saying there is a savior who loves you. And in this dark world, you can know him and you can have hope and security and you can know your sins forgiven and you can know him now and in eternity and you can know something solid on which to put your feet in a world which has no, there are zero foundations now. This is our message, friends. This is what I felt God laid on my heart to bring to you today. Might he be taking you on an adventure in prayer in the months and years to come to say, God, do something incredible amongst the next generation. Do it, Lord. Should we stand together and pray? I think we've got a little bit of time to pray and uh, maybe uh, Dan and the team could come and lead us. I wonder if we can sing in a moment, if we can sing that refrain of, if our God is for us, and who could ever stop us? Listen, he, he, even though I believe God is grieved by what he's seeing in our nation, and all of the many issues I've talked about today, I don't believe he's, I don't believe he's kind of like panicking. Okay? I believe he's about a great thing. He's sovereign. It's kind of hard to get our heads around, isn't it? But we're coming to one who is sovereign now. We're coming to one whose throne will never be, he'll never be knocked off the throne. So I wonder if we could lift our, our hands to him, lift our hearts to him, and just pray for a moment. And just if anyone else just, you know, just may want to pray out from where you are. I don't know. If you guys want to, got some friends from it, if you want to come and pray, come and pray. But let's just pray together, shall we, for the next generation. Let's pray about all we've just heard. Ask God for his help. Father, we thank you today that you are, you are stirring us. We thank you today that you are with us in our midst. And I pray, Lord God, that you would do in our hearts what you want to do. Lord, would you convince us of the desperation of this situation. Lord, would you break our hearts, Lord, for what breaks yours? Would it be, Lord, that we see Lowestoft through your eyes, Lord? That we see the next generation through your eyes? And Lord God, cause us to be deeply moved. Lord, we don't want to be indifferent, Lord. We don't want to be uh, casual about this, Lord. And I pray you would stir us to prayer. Lord, like never before, would you stir this church to prayer? Lord, like never before, would it be that we call upon you until you move in a mighty way? Would it be that you take us on an adventure in this, Lord? And I pray that you would help us, each one, to be so enjoying you, Lord, so enjoying you that it would be our delight to praise you to others. Lord, that we would want to praise you to the next generation, that we'd speak of your acts to the next generation. Lord, that we would not play church. We're done with that, Lord. We want to be those that are red hot for you. And Lord, that others would say, I want to be a part of that. I want to know this Jesus. I want to run with him. Lord God, would you do mighty things? Would you do mighty things at Lowestoft Community Church? Why don't you say that to him? Lord, do mighty things in this church. Do mighty things that only you can do. Do mighty things that only that it has to be. We say it can only be God because we, we haven't got the resources. Lord, come and do it in this church. Come and do it in this town through the other churches that love you. Come and do something wonderful. Move, Lord, we pray. Move, Lord, we pray. And would you stir some men and women even now to say, I'm going to give myself to praying for this. I'm not going to let go of you, Lord, until you start to move in wonderful ways. Is there anyone here, I wonder, just as we're in this moment, is there anyone here who just knows, yeah, I might not even be of that generation, but I'm, I know a hopelessness. I don't know Jesus. I don't know this. I don't know this God. If you're here today and you're just looking in, you are really welcome here. I speak on behalf of the leaders here. I you are very, very welcome here. But there may be someone just even now just knows, I need to give my life to him. I need to come into this hope, this living hope. If that's you, 
just with people's eyes closed. Can you just wave nice and clearly for me? Wonderful. Wonderful. Is there anyone else at all? Just even as we sing in just a moment, there's a moment for you just to talk to God where you are. He's not impressed by fancy words. <laughs> he doesn't need you to be somehow super eloquent like you're from a few centuries ago. He just wants your heart. So give me your heart. Is there anyone else just before we, before we sing? Wonderful. Wonderful. Just give him your heart as we sing. Bram, speed, either of you want to pray out? Come, you want to come and pray? Can you get, can we get up a mic? Just come and share, pray for these. These are my friends from Ipswich, Bram and Spee. I'm just going to, yeah, come and lead us and then we'll sing. Hello, church family. Hello. Hi there, church family. Um, yes, yeah, you don't know me, um, but I'm, I'm Bram um, from, from Ipswich. Um, yeah, just love to pray after what Tom's just said. Uh, Father, there's such a heaviness, um, I think, uh, on a lot of people's hearts. There's a lot of heaviness on my heart when we, when we, when we see um, the, the state of the UK. Lord, when we see the state, um, I'm 27, Lord, um, for people that don't know. I'm, I, I can see it, Lord. Lord, I, I, I see the despair. I see the, um, the unneeded fear, um, the, 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 the sadness, Lord, and this the the feeling that um, there's just a triviality to life. And Lord, I just thank you that you give us the purpose, the only purpose that matters, Lord. Lord, will you convict us this morning, um, um, and bring us a real hope in that, that when we wake up, the reason why we're all, uh, breathing today, Lord, is because of you. And Lord, we thank you for that. Um, give us that. Uh, uh, direction, um, that wisdom, and that just abundant joy that today we're alive because of you. Yeah. Heavenly Father, will you convict us that we're saved not by our own works, but by you, Lord? Yeah. Lord, when we say about the world and everyone's striving for greatness, everyone's striving to to be that better person in their own strength, maybe to to rise through the game of life, Lord. And Tom said, we want to be authentic. We really do, Lord. But Lord, we pray that you'll just convict us so deeply in our hearts this morning that we stand here forgiven by you. Um, you died for us when we were still sinners, Lord. When we, were, when we, were, we made ourselves enemies of you, Lord. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't our enemy, but we made ourselves enemies of you, Lord. And Lord, you said, no, I still love you. I still love you. So please, Lord, um, uh, will you help us to go out into this world with that knowledge? Not that we're some shiny Christians um, and telling, telling everyone to do things like us, but Lord, that we're pointing people to you. Um, Lord, we love you and we, we worship you. And help that love to be deeper and deeper and more genuine um, as you reveal yourself to us. And give us your compassion for the next generation. Your compassion, Lord. Help us to open our eyes. Thank you, Father. Amen. Just have a feeling that maybe there might be um, a couple of women in the room. Maybe one or two or maybe a group of women who are... Um, uh, maybe in their 50s or 60s who have been listening to what Tom brought this morning and thought, wow, that's me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm one of those people that need to um, step forward into this um, ministry of serving young people in maybe a way that you used to in the past or maybe in a brand new way. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to encourage you this morning to come and find someone if that's you.